One of my favorite stats, so there was a doctor who had spoken actually at a hidden opponent like Zoom that we had. She said, there's some between dental health and mental health. So there's two deaths a year with dental health, you know, your teeth and right. stuff like that. And then there's hundreds of thousands each year with mental health. And I think to myself, it's, okay, you're, you're um, handling the brain versus teeth. And it's like, where exactly do we have that wrong that we're prioritizing our teeth that much more than our brains? Yeah. And to me, it makes no sense because obviously why would the teeth be more of importance than your brain? Welcome to Bettering Badgers, brought to you by Uncub Madison. I'm Eden Rain, head of athlete engagement and former Badger Coxon for the women's lightweight team. And hey, I'm Justin Bob. I'm a former uh, men's soccer player, and I'm the author of uh, My Story, My Purpose with Uncut Madison and in the Uncovered section on the website. Um, when did we first meet, Justin? Um, I remember first meeting you back, it was the like pre-orientation introduction with the freshmen and then some of the- Yes, the peer leading group. Yeah, the peer leaders, I know. But I wasn't your peer leader. You weren't mine. I wish. But, I, <laughs> I wish. Yeah, you do wish. You were. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember we had our peer leader group and a bunch of the freshmen, we were all totally lost. And I think it was important to have that mm -hmm. to kind of get some experience from you guys and some of the older athletes and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember when I was a freshman, we did that and it was actually really fun. I got to meet a lot of other athletes on campus. And so when the opportunity came up for us to kind of simulate something similar to that for you know your class, I was like, I'm totally in. Let's do this. So I had a great time and then... Ever since then, ever we've since been then, yeah. It's taken off. <laughs> So Eden, now that uh, you're out of college, I know we had peer leaders and helpers when we first get to college, but now you're moving on. So what's it been like uh, going through that whole experience? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely consider, you know, freshman year of college, a season of transition. And I think I'm going through another one of those right now, you know, personally, emotionally, professionally. Um, now that I'm no longer a Badger athlete and a student here. So um, I did get to the job search a little bit late, but you know, I think I use that as an opportunity to just like keep my options open. I know there's going to be a lot of opportunities in the future and I knew at the time, especially with everything going on, like it was really important to be open and accept change, you know, sure. the past year and a half with COVID and all of that, like everyone kind of had to like reset and reprioritize what they want to do. And for me, I knew that if I added another thing to my plate, I honestly would have overwhelmed myself. So right now I'm just taking it day by day, learning more about myself figuring out what I like, what I don't like, what I'm good at, what I'm really not good at, and yeah. So as my college experience starts to close down and you know I'm older, I'm an upperclassman now, the thought gets stronger and stronger of like, okay, what's next? Like, uh, you know, what do I have left after this? And then like, you know, what am I supposed to do? And for me and a couple buddies and teammates and just friends that I've spoken to, you know, it's a very real thought and it's one that, you know, can drive you crazy because you never really know unless mm -hmm. you experience it and you can't experience it until after the, after college. So yeah. how, when you were going through college, how did you manage that? And then how would you say you kind of adjusted through that towards the end of it? Yeah, I definitely think I have a different vision I think I'm a lot more you know reflective now but during college I think there was a lot like a lot I don't want to say pressure but you know it was always that it was like you said it was, it's competitive it's always like you got to be you know striving to the top you got to be going for it and taking those risks and taking those risks are great but I think this past few months after graduating and everything um I know that whatever happens next, that's not where I'm going to end up. Like, it's just okay. a step in the process. And I think I had to realize that, you know, throughout my time in college, like, there's always more opportunities for 
anything. And so what, now like my next step after college, I know that's, that's just an, a stepping stone in the process in my own timeline. So it's important to remember that, you know, that pressure we want to have everything lined up after college, we want to know exactly what we're doing and, you know, be completely fully employed. That's, that's amazing if you are, but that's also not necessarily where we're going to finish and where we want to be, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the line. It's kind of a long game now. And that was something I didn't really realize until, you know, right before I graduated, like I'm in it for the long game now. <laughs> so was that a stressor for you when you were here at school? Uh, yeah, I think it was. Um, seeing, I think social media played a lot of influence for me personally, just yeah. seeing my older friends post on whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram about all these opportunities or my current friends and teammates just, or former classmates in high school even, like everyone's, it's plastered everywhere. And so that, I kind of started comparing myself to others and sure. that was just not healthy. Um, and that was the one thing that I kind of had to switch after graduating. It's like, you got to stop comparing yourself to others and questioning your own accomplishments. So Justin, talk to me about what's happened since your release of one of your groundbreaking stories, talking about your own mental health. Um, I've had a pretty cool experience since releasing my story a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. I had known for a while that I had wanted to release the story. Um, I wasn't exactly sure when or where, um, but I had been so focused on that, that part of my uh, timeline, that part of my story, mm -hmm. um, to work on that, finalize that, and then, you know, finally let go of that side of me that I never really shared. And so the day of uh, the release, um, it, there was a time in the day where I was like, okay, so what's going to be after this? And I, I really didn't know for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, um, what my next steps would be. But what has been really cool ever since is um, so many more opportunities have come up for me. I mean, there have been many different pathways of uh, whether it's people reaching out to me, just saying thank you, or it's um, potential avenues to get involved in other things. So we've been taking off with Uncut, the Bettering Badger stuff is a huge mm -hmm. program that I'm really excited about. Um, there is this local magazine at home we're doing a mental health write-up about. Uh, that would be very cool. And I've also joined um, a program called The Hidden Opponent. And that's a mental health advocacy group, um, specifically more towards uh, collegiate athletes. That's awesome. And it's been this program that's grown rapidly uh, the past year, year and a half, maybe two years. But um, it's all about promoting the conversation, stuff like that. And there are certain events, there's wristbands, uh, tabling events, talking to teams, all that kind of stuff. And we're kind of getting going with that as well, but it's been really exciting to see how involved I've been able to get and how involved uh, the community has been able to get as well. I think it's been, it's been interesting just to kind of coincidentally see that when I released my story, um, obviously it wasn't because of me, but <laughs> yeah. I think the timing of it to, for me personally to experience that and then to see someone like Naomi Osaka come right. out and talk about her struggles, Simone Biles come out and step away from the Olympics, which uh, is mm -hmm. the biggest stage on earth. Um, to me, that was her biggest feat. I think, I think it's just been interesting to see how it's being talked about more. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, of course, a lot more room to go and a lot more conversations to be had, but it's been very cool to kind of see how things have taken off in a way um, ever since. And um, it's been an awesome opportunity and there's plenty more to come. Definitely. Going back to you mentioning, you know, Simone and these, you know, elite athletes taking a step aside from their sport and prioritizing, you know, their own mental health. How can you relate to that? can relate to it pretty personally. Um, I've taken a massive pivot myself recently. Um, I've stepped away from the soccer team uh, in terms of playing for health reasons, mental health um, in particular. 
You know, I, I've learned over the years, um, just through experiences in high school and college, and you know, just really being brutally honest with myself and evaluating where I was and knowing what's healthy and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, I understood it was time to maybe pivot a little bit. Um, I also have my special ed program, which I'm really excited about, and we're kicking that off. But um, for me, it was me having to prioritize myself because for so long it was all about, you know, I, I try to be as outgoing as possible and take care of others when I can, but I've learned that you must take care of yourself before mm -hmm. anyone else because if you don't, you can't really be your true self. And so when I took the time to really evaluate and realize, you know, it's time to make a change, I had to take the leap. I mean, it, soccer was something I've trained for my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like it's forever out of my world. I mean, I'm still at the guys' games. I'm supporting them. I'm in and around the group and stuff like that. But I think it was important for me to realize what would be best for myself um, and how to go about that. And I've been very, very happy since. I've been a lot less stressed and a lot healthier as a result. Yeah. And so I think that that transition has been really cool because while yes, it's, it's uh, a breath of fresh air in a way, it's also, you know, a, a 180 to my life. I mean, yeah. it's a completely different lifestyle, structure, time change, mm -hmm. ways of exercising, which is massive for me personally and my mental health. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the anxiety of change, anticipation always, you know, is something I have had to deal with. But I think just the past couple months of not having it, I've been able to really kind of let go. I've yeah. been able to venture off a little bit, try new things, and change is hard. Change is really hard, especially when you're good at doing something you've done for so long. Yeah. And so I think the change, while it's difficult, I mean, even now, I mean, there's certain things you have to go through and learn, and I'll continue to learn the next two years and pass that, but I think understanding the balance of soccer and just everything else has been really important and I think I've done well with that balance so far. Yeah, and I think that's great. One thing that my dad told me, I don't know, when I was honestly going into high school um, that I've passed on to my teammates and my friends is that your happiness and health always come first, regardless of what you're doing, who you're around. If you're not happy doing that, like you gotta kind of reevaluate everything. It can sound cliche, yeah. but you really have to because time is so damn precious. Yeah, uh, seriously. You know, it's it's fast. It's really fast. I mean, what we were talking about with you and how that transition comes quickly and everybody, you know, it kind of comes up on you fast. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm experiencing it too, but uh, it's it's massive to really prioritize yourself and what you're doing and what, what will put you in the best position to make yourself happiest and healthiest. Mm -hmm. Time for some cue cards. <laughs> the question is, what are some misconceptions around student athletes and their mental health? I think one of the biggest misconceptions that comes up for me, you don't seem tough or brave if you're dealing with stuff and you show that. Yeah. I think it, there is that huge misconception that if you got something going on internally, there is something wrong with you. But the reality is, I mean, one of my favorite stats, so there was a doctor who had spoken actually at a hidden opponent like Zoom that we had. She said, there's some between dental health and mental health. So there's two deaths a year with dental health, you know, your teeth and right. stuff like that. And then there's hundreds of thousands each year with mental health. And I think to myself, it's okay, you're, you're um, handling the brain versus teeth. And it's like, where exactly do we have that wrong that we're prioritizing our teeth that much more than our brains? Yeah. And to me, it makes no sense because obviously why would the teeth be more of importance than your brain? Right, right. And so there just seems to be that weird stigma that if you have a therapist to go to, you say, oh, I have, I have an appointment. I got to go to. If you 
maybe want to go take medicine that you got to take and maybe go hide and go take it in your room or take it at night or something like that. But if you got a dentist appointment, you're like, oh, I got to go to the dentist, you know, maybe I'll get one of those toys there, whatever. It's like, <laughs> right. but really, it makes no sense. And mm -hmm. to me, you know, there used to be this perception of, oh, you're weak or it could seem a little weird that you got something going on upstairs and, you know, you can't really figure it out. But um, in reality, it's it's just like any other injury or problem or difference that you have in any other aspect of your life. So for me, that's the biggest mi misconception. I like, I've never heard that before. I'm going to use that. <laughs> but um, I think going along with what you said, what I initially thought was, you know, b growing up competing, whether it was soccer, I mean, uh, other sports as a kid, you know, what you roll your ankle on the field, you, oh, you uh, hyperextend your elbow or something, throwing a baseball or whatever, you know, what are your coaches telling you? Oh, walk it off, rub some dirt on it. Yeah. And like that injury, it's the same as anyone struggling with or having any mental health concerns, you know, it's an injury. And what do a lot of athletes tend to do with that? Like, like you said, we have this perception, like it could be, you know, shown as weakness. Like we bottle that up. We're like, we're walking it off. We ignore it. Um, and I think that misconception of that, like athletes have it all, you know, with all the resources, with academics, like, oh, you got a scholarship, like all of this. It's, it's not as, it's not that pretty. <laughs> and I think we just, a misconception is that that mental health is, it is an injury that we need to take care of. You know, if someone breaks an ankle, we take four plus weeks off to, you know, recover and take care of it and exactly. heal. And you're not on the field playing. You're, but you're still there supporting. But I think that still, that needs to be a little bit, there needs to be a lot more support with that with mental health. Okay. Are you ready for our next question? Love that. All right. So what is a mental health experience slash realization that you faced and now feel comfortable sharing? You take the rain this time. Okay. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is my, honestly, my transition into college. Specifically with um, rowing and my, my role on the team, um, back in high school, there was, you know, there was a race coming up that I really wanted to go into. And unfortunately, I wasn't selected to go. I did not handle it well, and it honestly, it changed me as a person a little bit for a couple of weeks, and like my, I noticed my, my eating and my sleeping, and the reason why I kind of handled it poorly was I was told that the reason I wasn't selected for that spot was because of my size. As a coxswain, you're supposed to be typically small, you know, you're steering the boat and I'm five seven, like I'm not the ideal size. So I took that like it was my problem being, you know, five seven. And I was like, what can I do? Like, how do I, I can't control that, but I still thought I like could do something about it. And I, I like couldn't stop thinking about that. Even going into college, being a recruited coxswain here, I kind of went through a similar position or a similar situation in a sense where I was not, you know, the typical size of a coxswain. And my coach knew that I was struggling with something, you know, because I couldn't really have serious conversations about it without breaking down. And so through that, what I thought was probably the worst time of my life was probably the best decision my coach had helped me make. It wasn't even my, I didn't even want to do this at first, but. And now looking back, I realized that probably was the smartest decision I made freshman year. And my coach pretty much told me, like, you're not going to race this year, this season. And we want you to be on the team because I know you want to be here. But we need you to be happy and healthy to be, you know, your best teammate, to be the best coxswain you can be. And so I, you know kind of came to terms with it and 
now I can talk about it and not cry, which is great, but um, yeah, I think that was one of the hardest things I probably had to go through, and I was young, but I, I honestly thought, like, I, I was like, what am I, like, what's, what's my purpose here, you know? So I have a follow-up question for you. You yeah. mentioned not being, well, a couple follow-ups. Yeah. You mentioned not being able to eat or sleep for a bit. Um, how long? Um, Did that last, if you don't mind asking? It was, at least during, from high school, it was at least like two to three weeks, like until the fall season was over. And then in the fall, like when I knew I wasn't getting boated and stuff because of me even handling or like still struggling to kind of cope with what had happened, like. I noticed those habits had changed significantly, like honestly, for the whole year. So, so during those two, three weeks, did you consciously uh, not eat and not, well, sleep? I guess you're not really choosing. But I didn't even like. It's because you you genuinely couldn't. I couldn't like I take just it down and stuff sick. like that yeah. and sick and. I had no energy. Like I would just would sleep. I would go to class and I would like just not. I couldn't like talk to anyone. It was and crazy hard. That that makes sense because um, obviously it's it's all about ups and downs. Yeah. I mean it's not always gonna be consistent up or up or down. Mm. But um, it makes sense to hear that things come and go. By the end of the two three weeks, what do you think helped you kind of get out of that? Um, my family definitely. They yeah. were I they were the only people I could talk about it with at first. If anyone else asked about it, I would literally break down. So I could only talk t to my parents and my siblings about it. <laughs> so you kept it, you kept it internal the yeah. whole time? Mm -hmm. But to finally... Getting it off my chest. Like sometimes I even think about it and I like look back and I'm, I'm like, I, I kind of like, there are parts where that are like honestly fuzzy from that time of my sure. life. Sure. Where I'm like, whoa. I think when I finally stopped like pointing the thing, like my own finger at myself, you know, like it's it's me, like I'm the issue here. Like what stopped me from doing that was when I realized how common it was, whether it was body image issues and with female sports or just like in our society in general. I honestly couldn't tell you how, what it took for me to like open up about what was happening. You don't realize how common it is until you start like talking about it, so. Right, and I, I think there's, a big difference from going from not understanding to then being willing to learn, but then being willing to accept it. Right. Because I'm sure through your experience, it was hard to accept at time. Like you said, you took the time to listen and ask questions, but it was hard to accept. And then for me to realize, okay, I actually have this genuine mm -hmm. uh, difference. Uh, it's not a disability, but a difference. And kind of have that worry pop through my mind, but know how to handle it and accept that makes it a lot easier on yourself. Um, and it shows through our two experiences, just those small sample sizes. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that the age uh, difference um, about uh, and the gap of understanding, um, yes, there, there is a difference in that, but I also think it's important to realize it's never too late to learn. Right. Because whether we're now eight years old or 10 years old, learning about this stuff, mm -hmm. getting medicated and talking about it, or if, I mean, I, my mom will be the first to tell you she's learned a crap ton ever since, you know, we've been going through it. And I think having conversation, whether it's with people that are younger you, uh, than you and people that look up to you, people that are your friends or people that are older than you, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's very well known at this point, but it's just a matter of comfort and communication. Yeah. And I think the more consistent we get with that, the easier it'll be to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So. And then it'll be destigmatized. Absolutely, we gotta keep working towards it. Oh yeah. But I think we're all set. So thank you very much for sitting with me. I had a great time, Justin. It was a great conversation. And. I'll see you down the road. This concludes. Lettering Badgers.